enforcement of HUD Section 3, which essentially says if you are working in public housing, 30% of your local hires and procurement has to go to the local residents. There is absolutely very, very weak diversity inclusion policies from the EPA. They kind of borrow from the Department of Transportation. If, so anyway, there is an infrastructure that's really in the place. Kind of launching pad for life. But what ends up happening when people are compromised, particularly economically, is that they're making trade-offs between affordability and adequacy. Or they're making trade-offs between affordability and stability. They're making trade-offs between affordability and neighborhood opportunities. And it's actually- With our built environment. Uh, whether it's around energy, whether it's around health, uh, resource use, so on and, and so forth. So that's, that's really where it is. So our goal at the Green Building Council, as Kimberly said this morning, was initially to focus on the front 25% of the marketplace, transform the marketplace, and we've seen that transformation happen. Every single day in 160 some countries around the world, we are certifying 2.2 million square feet of space. So in Pittsburgh, one of so our- architecture first, and uh, history is very important for African Americans. Um, oftentimes we look at the lack of history on early African-American architects and their contributions in what we re reference as the new world. Um, architecture is divided into three main stylistic areas, um, Spanish, English, and French. And when you look at North America, or the United States of America, there are three very dominant styles of architecture. The architecture that was brought over from France, the architecture that was brought over from Spain, and the architecture from England. You think about the original 13 colonies, English architecture. You look at the Midwest, French architecture. New Orleans comes to example. You think about uh, West uh, Coast and California, Spanish influence. However, the dominant person in all three of those areas was the African. The Africans brought here enslaved to build this new world. But there's no influence that is spoken of or documented on the African influence on American architecture. And so today, there's no secret that there's less than 1.5% African American architects in the country. No secret that there's less than 0.3% of them are African American females. This is less than 2,000 total African American architects in the country. It's less than 600 women African American architects in the country. My colleague, Dr. Henry Louis Gates at Harvard often quotes that wherever you go in history, there have been black people who have been making contributions, but their contributions have been obscured, they've been lost, and they've been buried. It's important for African American people to be engaged in architecture so that we can unexcavate the rich legacy of people who have built. Levels is very critical. And what happens often, um, as I quoted those numbers of 60 African American professors, is that oftentimes the people who are underrepresented are not the leaders. And as a result, do not really have the uh, power and authority to um, sort of exert the type of change that is necessary. So like for example, at Morgan State University, where I went as an undergraduate student initially, uh, when I went there as a student, the dean was African American, the chairs were African American, and there were lots of African American faculty. I just reported now, 11 years later, that I'm the only African American faculty member to be at the rank of professor. I am only one of two other African American faculty members at the school, and everyone else doesn't look like me. And then, you see, so there's a change, and there are many other schools like that. And so the numbers are not doing this, they're doing that. And so we have a huge problem before we get in. So oftentimes what, uh, what happens is that uh, minority contractors are, uh, and architects are brought in under the auspice of a, a team. And uh, which is which is great, great introduction to um, uh, getting in, involved in larger projects. But uh, what, what I, I have seen historically that's been happening is that those teams are formed by majority firms and they, the, the uh, role that they um, give the minority uh, firm to play is minimal oftentimes, or marginal, if you will. <clears throat> and, uh, and so the minority firm gets some experience, but not enough to ever really get to a point where they can apply for the project on their own. And we, we need to uh, work on that. 
that's that's a, a real problem because you get stuck in a rut. Uh, seeing this happen with firms around the country, and and they they, they never get out of that rut. They're, you know, not that it's not that they're not getting any work at all, but they're not growing. The potential to grow is is really limited. So we we need to to change that. And um, you know maybe it's the selection process that, that uh, the, um, the the various owners or government entities are. We're using maybe we can come up with something more creative that would uh, allow minority um, firms to stretch and uh, and, and and build uh, uh, more uh, more uh, capacity, if you will. So. Right. Well, we are out of time, uh, but is there any any policy um, recommendations for the NAACP to campaign around that you would? Yeah, let me just, I've been wanting to put this one piece out here about the equity that I was mentioning. And I use this analogy often because, again, you know, it's hard stuff to talk about, but we have to, you know, confront these things. When we talk about equity, I often use an analogy and a visual that if the dominant race is white, for which in our profession it is, and they establish the bar at four feet, then let's call the Latino three feet, let's call the Asian two foot, and let's call the black one foot. And if the bar is gonna be set at four feet, we simply put, have to add three feet to the African American, we have to add two feet to the Asian, and we have to add one foot to the Latino in order for us to create what the founding proposition of this country was, that all people are created equal. Because what Bill just referenced about the minority contracts and et cetera is just not going to sustain us. It is not going to grow us. It is not going to help us to recruit people who look like us into this profession. And so until we are serious about what it takes to make an equal, equitable development opportunity for all persons, then we might as well pack up and go home. But that is what it's going to take, in my opinion. Thanks. Can we give these gentlemen a round of applause?